Hello. Today we are going to continue reading part three of Echo by Pam Munoz Ryan. So let's take a deep breath in and exhale. And let's begin. Chapter 10. That evening at dinner, Ivy listened to Papa's ranting. She felt as if she'd been fed through the ringers on the washing machine. My family has lived here for over 100 years. My great-grandfather worked on a rancho when the very land belonged to Mexico and was not yet California. You, Ivy, are already an American, just as Mama and I are, and our parents before us, and their parents before them. May they rest in peace. Luz, they said nothing about two schools when you registered her. Nothing, said Mama. They took the papers. They told me thank you. They said she could start today and the bus would pick her up. Bertina did not mention it in her letter. Mrs. Ward said nothing when I asked her about the bus. Everyone here behaves as if this is the accepted way. And your friend said nothing, said Papa, looking at Ivy. Ivy shook her head. All through dinner, Papa would be silent for a few minutes, then erupt again. Why are things different here? In Fresno, many children went to school together. Japanese, Filipino, Mexican, Anglo. Are we not in the same state of California? He served himself spoonfuls of Mama's albondiga soup and continued talking, a meatball balanced on his spoon. So it is fine if we join them for music and sports, but only after school. It is fine if we join them in war. My son is fighting for our country. What nonsense is this? Papa slurped and chewed. I will talk to the principals of both schools and have you transferred. Ivy stared into her bowl, pushing the meatballs around. Something told her that Papa was not going to let this go. She was grateful for his defense, but at the same time she worried. Would he make a scene with the principals? What if Papa was successful and she was transferred? Would the teachers treat her the same as the other students? Would the parents from Lincoln and Annex complain and cause problems? And what if Papa wasn't successful? Would she be teased even more by the boys who sang Old MacDonald? Would the students at Lincoln Annex say Ivy held her nose in the air, thinking herself too good for them? Her head spun. I will call in the morning to make an appointment, said Papa. Until then, you will stay home. A little voice in her head whispered, orchestra. Ivy panicked. Papa, I don't want to miss the meeting about the orchestra on Thursday. Please? Ivy, this is about your education, not about extra activities that serve no purpose. She sat a little taller. But it serves a purpose for me. Music is important to me, and Fernando told me to keep playing. He said it brought joy to our family. My mom must have seen desperation on Ivy's face because, papa, because she told Papa, Victor, you will not make a problem for Ivy's sake. I will not make a problem, said Papa. I will make a solution. When Papa came home Wednesday evening, he walked straight to the living room and sank into a chair. Ivy and Mama followed, sitting across from him on the sofa. What happened, Papa? asked Ivy. Papa shook his head, looking defeated. Victor? Mama pressed. He cleared his throat. The principals both said the same thing, that this was district policy. They agreed it did not make sense, but their hands are tied. He looked at Ivy. I am so sorry. Ivy had never heard him sound so full of regret. She could tell he thought he had failed her. Papa, it's all right. No, it's not. If things stay the same, it will never be right. Mama, he looked at Mama perplexed. He told me that the Mexican children are separated because of language and health issues. Health issues? Asked Mama. Like what? Papa, I'm not sick, said Ivy. 
Papa frowned. The principal at Lincoln, Maine, looked me right in the eyes and said that many of the Mexican children are dirty and need baths and that they have head lice and carry illnesses. Dirty? But this is not reasonable, said Mama. And all children have the same illnesses. Now Papa's voice grew tight with frustration and anger. Luz, there was no reasoning with him. I told him that Ivy speaks perfect English and that she is ahead of her grade in all subjects. And he said that while that might be true, he could not admit her to the school because then it would not be fair to the other Mexican children. He also told me that it is illegal for me to keep her home from school if she is not sick. Illegal! What about the principal at Lincoln Annex? Ivy asked. Papa sighed. He agrees that you should not be spending afternoon, every afternoon, helping the third grade teacher. They will test you for sixth grade after the vacation. He also told me that parents from all over Orange County are forming a group and that they are inviting a lawyer to counsel them. There will be a meeting soon. Victor, maybe this is not the right place for all of us. Maybe we should go back to Fresno. Couldn't you get your job back? Stunned, Ivy looked at Mama. She was willing to give up all of this for her? Mama, the house and your garden and the washing machine. At what price, Ivy? You cannot even attend the regular public school. Papa is always saying education is everything. Papa rose from the chair and paced the room. That is a possibility. I am sure I could get my job back. He looked out the front window into the grove, but wasn't nodding in agreement. He was shaking his head as if to say he didn't want to leave all of this. If they left, he would never get to fulfill this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. As much as she missed Ariseli and Miss Delgado, Ivy knew in her heart that if they returned to Fresno, it would be a step backward. It was just as Araceli's father had said, everyone moves from La Colonia sooner or later, and if they want to get ahead in this world. Ivy didn't want to risk all of the things they had, already, they had always wanted. Besides, Fernando was counting on her. Before Papa could decide, Ivy blurted, I think we should stay. I can make the best of Lincoln Annex. My teacher is kind, and, and I can ask for permission to work ahead or go into the sixth grade, like you said. Besides, I already wrote Fernando all about our new house and how much he will love it here. I can live in two worlds. I will go to Lincoln Annex during the day and Lincoln, Maine after school. Papa looked as if, at Ivy as if he had never seen her before. Finally, he gave her a little smile and nodded. I agree, Ivy. It is wiser to stay here, stay where there are more opportunities for all of us, and to fight for what is right. I promise I will do that. I am going to that meeting to see what can be done about this situation. But it will take time for things to change, said Mama, putting her hand on Ivy's arm. Yes, said Papa, it will take time. The school district is not going to change their minds soon. Ivy knew what they were saying. The change might not come in time to benefit her. She might have to go to Lincoln Annex for the next two years, even though it was wrong. She thought of the Yamamotos, also display, misplaced, and how their humiliation had to be ten times, a hundred times worse. I understand. May I please go to the orchestra meeting tomorrow? Papa blew out a long breath. Yes if it is of such importance. Ivy ran to Papa and gave him a hug. It is, Papa, you will see. Later, she lay on the bed and stared into the dark, second-guessing whether staying would be worth it. She didn't want to feel singled out or less than anyone else. She wanted to belong and to be someone who mattered. Even if she joined the orchestra at Lincoln, Maine, she would never really belong there. Not the way Susan, or the others did. Even though she had taken a bath earlier, Ivy suddenly felt dirty. 
and even though she was healthy, she felt sick. She had never had head lice, but now she reached up and touched her hair. It felt as if tiny insects crawled all over her scalp and nibbled at her skin. Hot tears rolled down her cheeks. She slipped from her bed, took Fernando's jacket from the closet and put it on. For the first time since he'd given it to her, she wore it to bed. How would she keep her family together when she was the one who was a little bit broken? Chapter 11 when Ivy stepped aboard the bus Thursday morning, she could see Susan holding a protective arm across her seat. Ivy slid in next to her. Are you okay? You missed two days of school. I wasn't feeling well, Ivy said, and it wasn't really a lie. Today is the orchestra meeting. My mom talked to your mom about giving you a ride home after. Ivy nodded. She told me. I didn't get... To sit next to you Monday after school, you can always save seats. The bus driver allows it. How was your first day? Susan seemed genuinely concerned about Ivy, so Ivy wasn't sure why she still felt betrayed. Okay, said Ivy, trying to sound cheerful. My teacher is nice. I'm way ahead of everyone else, though. I might go to sixth grade, Susan groaned. We had a test in math. I'm so far behind. She looked desperate and sounded overwhelmed. Ivy felt sorry for her all over again. I can help you if you like. Remember, I said I would. The bus start stopped at Lincoln, Maine. That would be great, Susan said, hugging her before she got up and headed down the aisle. As the bus pulled away, Ivy heard the boys singing. And on that farm, they had a pig. A bit, She bit the inside of her lip a little too hard to keep from crying and tasted blood. After school, Ivy was the only one to get off the bus at Lincoln, Maine for orchestra. Why didn't any other students from Lincoln Annex come? Did they know something Ivy didn't? The music room was the size of two classrooms, several long tables stretched across the front, displaying assorted instruments in their cases, horns, flutes, violin, an oboe, a cello. Against the sidewall, a piano, that looked like a drum set hid, hid, and what looked like a drum set, hid under padded covers. About 20 students sat in front of Mr. Daniels, a stocky man with a gray beard and a mustache. Susan waved and pointed to the chair next to her in the front, when, in the front row. Ivy walked over and sat down. Mr. Daniels pressed his hands together. If you are here today, you are interested in embarking on an incredible adventure in the orchestra. All heads nodded. Mr. Daniels handed out information sheets and the schedule for practices. Your parents will have to sign a permission slip and you will be responsible for your precious instruments. The government has issued a ban on making new ones because the manufacturers are now obligated to make products for the war effort. Unfortunately, we do not know how long it will last. One of the girls raised her hand. My mom said there might not even be an orchestra next year. Is that true? Mr. Daniels cleared his throat. <clears throat> Some of the parents are questioning why the school district is paying for a music teacher during a war. Well, I think the opportunity makes to make music is a gift Everyone should receive at least once in their lifetime, whether they unwrap it all the way or not. For many of you, this might be your only musical experience. If that is the case, I want to make it magnificent. Besides, everyone needs the beauty and light of music, especially during the worst of times. So, all the more reason to perform majestically this year and bring a little brightness to a dark world. In this way, we might convince our opponents that the music program is worthy enough to continue. I hope you agree. Ivy liked Mr. Daniels already. Now, let's get to know one another. As we work our way around the room, introduce yourself and tell me which instrument you'd like to learn, or if you play already play an instrument. 
Ivy listened as the students shared their preferences and Mr. Daniels recorded them on his clipboard. Some had taken piano, one boy had played the cello for four years, another the drums. When it was her turn, she said, my name is Ivy Maria Lopez. Behind her, one of the boys started to whisper, E-I, E-I-O, and then giggled. Her stomach did a somersault. She looked down to the floor. Was this why mo more students from Lincoln Annex hadn't come for, from orchestra? Mr. Daniels clapped his hands three times. That is enough. I expect concert manners in this very class. And that means being respectful of every musician. Everyone in this room is welcome here. Go on, Ivy. Your friend Susan told me you would be joining us from the other school. Is it true you were going to play a solo on the radio? Susan had told him about her? She looked up and nodded. When I lived in Fresno, I'm not sure which instrument I'm interested in learning. Maybe the flute. So far, I only play the harmonica. More laughing erupted. Someone snickered. That's not an instrument. Mr. Daniels crossed his arms. Some of you might be surprised to know that there is a classical harmonica player, Larry Adler, who performs with symphony orchestras all over the world. I heard him play Rhapsody in Blue on the radio, and it was sublime. Ivy, do you have your harmonica with you? Ivy nodded. Could you play us a little something? As she stood up and took the harmonica from her pocket, she looked around. Some of the students were hiding smirks with their hands. What if she didn't play well? They'd laugh even more. She blew a warm-up chord and in her head heard Miss Delgado and Fernando telling her she had a gift. And in that moment, she knew she, just, she had just as much right to be here at the Lincoln, Maine school as the Lincoln, Maine students. She began when Johnny comes marching home. When Johnny comes marching home again, Hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then. Hurrah, hurrah. She closed her eyes and let herself be carried away on the emotions of the song. She knew the heartache of missing someone long gone, and she imagined the joyousness of their reunion. She played the first verse like a march, rousing and purposeful. The second she drew out slow and melancholy. The room had been designed for music and the sounds amplified. She played to the ceiling so the notes would travel upward and bounce back. When she reached the last verse, she infused it with as much gumption and longing as she could pull from her heart. After the final note, there was a moment of silent expectation. The only sound, the shuffling of feet. Ivy braced herself for laughter but instead heard clapping. Ivy, thank you, said Mr. Daniels. That was unquestionably brilliant. You have promise, and I have a feeling, he shook a finger at her and smiled, that you are going to fall in love with the flute. She beamed at Mr. Daniels and sat down. Still flushed from playing, Ivy wished Fernando could have heard her. He would have given more than a penny for that concert. Now, if there are no other remarks about Ivy or the harmonica, and I see there are none, then let's talk about the schedule. I will teach strings on Monday, percussion on Tuesday, horns on Wednesday, and winds on Thursdays. I'll hand out the instruments the week after you return from vacation. The week of January 11th, we will begin in earnest. Ivy sat with rapt attention. Mr. Daniels's words, incredible adventure, beauty and light, unquestionably brilliant, begin in earnest, fueled her with optimism. You did really good today, said Susan as they waited on the front steps of the school for Mrs. Ward. Ivy polished the harmonica with the hem of her dress. Thanks for telling Mr. Daniels I'd be coming from the other school. That was nice. Susan whispered, I I'm sorry, Ivy. I thought you knew about the two schools. I felt so bad that you didn't. After my mom talked to your mom, she felt horrible too. She said it never occurred to her to mention it. And she said it must have been quite a shock for all of you. 
I've never been separated before, ever. It's just what they do here, said Susan. But the Filipinos go to your school, and the Japanese went before they, they were sent away, so why not the Mexicans? I don't know. It's been like this since I can remember. They call Lincoln Annex the old MacDonald had a farm school. Susan looked down. I, I know. My father talked to the principals yesterday, but she felt her eyes brimming. Yeah, said Susan. Every year, one of the Mexican families tries to get their child changed. Her sentence trailed off. Ivy knew what came next, but it never does any good. My mom was so upset about the whole thing. She said we should move back to Fresno. Susan's face wrinkled. You aren't going to, are you? Ivy saw panic in her eyes. No, we're staying and fighting, and I'm going to stay in the orchestra. Susan let out a sigh. I'm so glad. Me too, said Ivy. Tomorrow, we're going to my grandma's for the holidays, said Susan. My dad is coming back right after Christmas, but my mom and I are staying until New Year's Day. We want to meet at Want to meet at the wagon the day after I get home, same time? She held up cross fingers and looked hopeful. Susan seemed to have everything except a friend. And Ivy wanted des and she wanted desperately to be Ivy's. Maybe Ivy wouldn't matter to the other students at Lincoln, Maine, but she mattered to Susan. How could Ivy turn her down? She nodded. I promise. Chapter 12. Christmas Eve didn't feel the same without Fernando, who had always insisted they drink hot chocolate and eat cookies and stay up until midnight to open presents. Ivy sat down between Mama and Papa on the sofa, the three of them indulging in his tradition, yet feeling his absence. Papa held up his cup of cocoa. Merry Christmas. Mama and Ivy raised theirs and repeated, Merry Christmas. Mama reached over and adjusted his high school photograph a tiny bit to the left. And back and back to the right. And to Nando, she said, we miss you. He is with us in spirit, said Papa. And I, I have a surprise for both of you. He pulled two envelopes from behind his back. Letters? asked Ivy. They came this morning, said Papa. I happened to be out front when the mailman arrived. I saved them as a surprise. Ivy took the letter addressed to her. Mama clutched the other to her chest. Even in the dim light, Ivy could see Mama's eyes glistening as she opened it and smoothed out the paper. She held the letter close to the lamp and read aloud, Dear Mama and Papa, I'm so sorry I haven't written for so long. I'm in advanced training, and we do not, we have not been able to send mail, only receive it. I guess they don't want any of our radio secrets to leak out. Loose lips sink ships. That means if we talk without centering our words, the information could fall into the enemy's hands and make things dangerous for other soldiers. I received Papa's letters yesterday, a house in Orange County. Well, that is something. It sounds like a good deal all around. It will be nice to come home once and for all. I want to put down roots. Here is my news. I am now a certified field radio operator. I can take apart a radio and put it back together faster than anyone in my unit. And I get a reception when others cannot. My new nickname is Mars Lopez. My buddies tease that I can reach another planet on the radio if I set my mind to it. Papa laughed. Mars Lopez. That is fitting. The other news is that I have finally received my orders. I will be going over soon on a military air transport. Going over to where? asked Ivy. He is not allowed to say, Papa. Go on, Luce. You know how those planes with those planes with the big bellies? I will be inside one of them. I do not know the exact day, 
only that it will be within a few weeks. There is talk that this war cannot last too much longer. Even the officers say so. Mama looked up from the letter. Even the officers say the war will be over soon. Papa smiled and squeezed her hand as she continued reading. They show us newsreels every week, and we see how Americans all over the country are going, are doing their part, big and small, for the war. I feel proud to be doing mine. With much love, your son, Fernando. If the war ends soon, the next Christmas he will be with us, said Mama. Papa cleared his throat. Yes, I predict that the new year will be even better. In two weeks, Mr. Yamamoto's son will come to sign the papers. I will attend the meetings to see what might be done about Ivy's school. By the time this war is over, we will have, Papa's voice cracked, our own house for Fernando to come home to. Yes, next year will be promising. While Mama and Papa huddled together and reread the letter, Ivy opened hers and read silently. Dear Ivy, I just received your letter. I am sorry you had to miss your performance on the radio. I hope you will play the solo for me when I come home. But it sounds like good things are coming for all of us once this war is over. Every battalion has a motto, brave in difficulties. Our utmost forever, ready in peace and war. My battalion's motto is forward to defend the truth. Let's do that in our family too. I am counting on you to be a good little soldier and march forward. I hope you are still playing the harmonica. What I wouldn't give for one of your concerts now. Over. In radio lingo, that means I'm finished talking and I'm waiting to hear what the person on the other end has to say. And that is you. Love, Nando. P.S. Remember how you were saving war stamps in Fresno? My sergeant said a 10 set war stamp will buy five bullets and each bullet will stop a Nazi. The truth is, the sooner we stop them, the sooner the war will be over and I'll be home. At the bottom of the piece of paper, Fernando had taped a penny and Ivy held up the letter to show Mama and Papa and smiled for a concert. It was just after midnight. She kissed Mama and Papa goodnight and left the letter with them so they could read it too. She went to her room and stood at the window, gazing into the shadows in the orange grove. She raised the harmonica and played the Battle Hymn of the Republic for Fernando. The lyrics resounding with pride and love and dedication. Glory, glory.